Hi, I'm Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. We come to you from the studios of Greenfield Community Television at 393 Main Street. And today, episode number 186, if I am correct, is taking place 13 years after, I don't know if it was episode three or four, but that was the last time that Dean Sycon was on. Dean, thank you for coming back on the show. I've been practicing ever since. <laughs> and Well, good, because that first show was a disaster. I know. Um, actually, the first show was great. Mm -hmm. And I, I always had in the back of my mind Cheese and onions, uh, that's the Ruddles. Uh, yeah. We don't need to make re oblique re references, but um, I've always wanted to have you back on because I admire you so much. What oh, you're doing you. is making a real difference. Um, you were the first person to basically say that people who grow coffee can make a living growing coffee. And you have put your money where your mouth is and it's actually worked. The whole fair trade, you kind of were an originator of that. Yeah. Of that. And now it's a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. My pleasure. It's been a life of uh, a life's work. Well, you're continuing your life's work by coming back on here now and explaining to our lovely viewers about what's going on with coffee and as it relates to immigration. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you mentioned to me at the Green River Festival, and I had no idea. So, what's going on with immigration and as in regards to the coffee growers? Well, it's interesting. Um, at the turn of the millennium was the last time we had uh, a migration crisis of this magnitude, meaning so many people coming up against the southern border. In fact, around the millennium, there were more people than there are today. Right. Okay? And what was happening then was that the um, agricultural prices around the world had crashed, and coffee, being a large agricultural crop in Latin America, meant that people couldn't make a living growing coffee, and so they were thrown off their lands by landlords, or they abandoned their land because they couldn't feed their family, and headed north. So that happened around the year 99, 2000, and it was a big deal. And I was uh, working a lot in Nicaragua at the time particularly, and met a lot of people who were headed north and heard stories about it, and heard stories about the death train, which is this large, oh, yes. right, the La Bestia, the, uh, the beast, which travels from the Guatemalan Mexican border all the way to the United States, a 16 hour train ride. People fall off it, people get raped, people get robbed. It's just a horrendous thing. Um, but there it is, and we discovered that it was owned by a Connecticut company. So we contacted the Connecticut company and tried to get them to change the way they treated migrants on the trains because their their drivers were you know stopping and starting and trying to knock people off and things like that so we got them to change some of their behaviors but not cancel the train altogether right of course it was a big business so anyway from that experience i learned about this migration pattern of central americans specifically related to coffee um, and, we, and we tried to do some projects with uh, repatriation, uh, job training and repatriation from Mexico back to El Salvador, back to Guatemala, successfully but on a very small scale. Right. Well, then the prices rose and it became less of an issue over time and uh, so people moved on. Well, here we are 20 years later, uh, almost 20 years later, and I was looking at the migration patterns coming up against the border and I thought, you know, What's going on here? The price of coffee is almost an all-time low, just like it was back in the millennial days. Um, the amount of people coming through are largely agricultural workers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, talk about gang violence and that sort of thing, but the truth is the majority of people coming are coming because they, they, they can't make a living anymore. So, for example, Guatemala, which is the largest um, individual group of migrants comes from Guatemala. The largest group of Guatemalans comes from Weiwei Tenango, one of the provinces, and the largest group of people in Weiwei are coffee growers. Interesting. So on my last visit there in January, I was talking to the co-op people I work with there and asking, you know, how many people from the area have fled? And they said, oh, you know, we're going to drive past all these abandoned farms. And uh, it's, it's that simple, you know, it's so the, the, the big point to me is so many people in Washington talk about this migration crisis. What do we do? What do we do? Let's build a wall. Let's stop people from coming. It's like, well, you know, there's actually 
one easy solution to a large part of the problem, and that is for coffee companies and consumers to pay more money for the coffee. Right. Now, you wouldn't know it when you go to the supermarket and you have to pay 13 to $18 a pound for my competitors. Obviously, we don't do that. But, um, you know, people wouldn't know it by the cost of coffee here because most coffee companies haven't dropped their price even though the cost of coffee has dropped 70% since, 19, since 2014. Now that's counterintuitive to me because yeah. one of the things that you said on the show 13 years ago mm -hmm. was that with you were talking about the climate crisis. And, yeah, and it's, it's, it's still a good topic to talk about. So th that would make, make it harder to grow coffee. That's correct. Well then that would reduce the supply, wouldn't? You're right, if this was Economics 101, you'd be absolutely right. But unfortunately, and I've been waiting for it, you know, I keep waiting for the, for the price of coffee to skyrocket because of the shortage. So a number of years ago, about uh, seven years ago, there was a crisis, a, a secondary crisis, because of rust, which is La Roya, which is a, uh, fungus. a fungus that grows, that's always in the soil, right. but it's usually kept in check. So what happened because of climate change is there was an outburst of La Roya throughout Central America and in, uh, in places like Colombia, 30% of the national crop was destroyed. So you would think, wow, 30% of the crop is gone, but the same amount of people want the coffee. Therefore, supply and demand, the price should skyrocket, and it never did. Why? Why is that? Because price is not determined by the Adam Smithian okay. invis invisible hand. Price in coffee is not determined by a willing buyer and a willing seller, except in the case of fair trade, right. where we actually make those uh, transactions. But price in coffee is determined um, in New York in a ring of traders. Uh, I call them the lords of the ring. It's, it's uh, traders just like a stock market. Okay, commodities. Young men in commodities in tu uh, tunics of different colors representing their house. And they go in and bid up and down the price of coffee based on their projection of whether there's going to be a lot of coffee, you know, whether there's going to be a change in the amount of coffee coming in from China, which is going to be a big supplier in the next couple of years. And it's totally divorced from what it takes the coffee farmer to grow and process the coffee and then maybe have a little profit so that he can feed his family. That's not it. It's totally delinked from that. So as long as coffee is delinked from how I would price my product, right. you know, it, it doesn't really have a cause and effect relationship. There's just too many other things going on because it's become a speculative commodity. When actually you could probably apply that same model to everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But unfortunately in coffee, um, people don't know about this. Right. And so for coffee companies, you know, the large companies, I'll, I'll just name them, Starbucks, Green Mountain, et cetera, they get lauded by the stock market because they're so much more profitable this year. Why are they more profitable this year? Because their cost of goods has gone down 20 to 70 percent. And they're, and they're not making a different change in the price. No, they're not and dropping so they're the price. they're just taking profit. Exactly. Yeah, but well, it's not going back to the farmer. It's only staying in the corporate pockets. So the shareholders are doing well. Yeah, absolutely. Coffee is a very lucrative business. So what happens for the, when... For the retailers. Right. Yeah. But this is not, that's not a sustainable model. No, it isn't. But, you know, I think the, it's a, it's a funny thing. I used to buy, I buy all my coffee direct now. Mm -hmm. But when I was much, much smaller and I had to go through a broker, I would say to the broker, okay, I want to buy 20 bags of Guatemalan. And he'd say, okay, that's going to be $1.50 a pound. And I'd say, but but the price today is $1.40 a pound. And he'd say, yeah, but I have to base it on what it's gonna cost me for the next one, the replacement cost. I said, oh, okay. So that means if it's $1.50 today, but you think there's gonna be more coffee, you're gonna sell it to me for $1.40 because the replacement cost is gonna be lower? He said, oh, of course not. I'm gonna sell it to you for what I bought it for. And I thought, okay, so, so there's no logic in heads this. Heads he wins, tails he wins. Exactly. So there's no economic logic really in this in this industry. It's based on uh, winner take all, and the winner is the importer, the retailer, you know. And frankly, the amount of money that large companies and even some medium-sized coffee companies are making is, I find it disgusting. So is there an? Do you see a solution to this? I mean, you're doing what you can by buying direct. Yeah. 
Well, fair trade, you know, fair trade is, is a good model, but fair trade is a misnomer. Fair trade should be called fairer trade mm -hmm. because it's ultimately still based on the C price, that international price we're right. talking about. So it goes up and down too. Sure. I mean, the, the, the fair trade minimum for organics is $1.91 a pound, and today the price of coffee on the market is 94 cents. So needless to say, fair trade offers a substantial buffer from the market when the market is down. Right. When the market goes up, if it goes past that $1.91, which it does every couple of years, then fair traders only have to top that by a nickel or a dime. Right. So it's not, it, it doesn't take the injustice out of the market, it just makes it a kinder, gentler market, you know. Mm -hmm. But one that the farmers can live on, even if living doesn't mean getting new clothes, getting new cars, whatever, it means hanging on. Well, the thing is, is what part of what you've done with these um, coffee co-ops is you have actually helped the local economies where the coffee is grown so that other businesses can thrive. Oh, absolutely. And no. schooling, education can take place. Yeah, see, you, most people who buy fair trade coffee don't even understand what the system is. They think it's just a price. But the, the, the real anchor of fair trade and social justice in coffee is, is the cooperatives. Because we have to remember that the farmers are these marginalized, often indigenous peoples living in these small communities way up in the mountains. They don't have access to roads, they don't have access to processing, they don't have access to credit, they don't have access to information. And they don't even own the and land. And often don't own the land, right. yeah. So what, what happens is they need all these intermediaries, maybe five or six of them, before that stuff gets on the boat and comes to America. So they don't see that money, that all goes to the middlemen. So what we've done in the cooperative movement, which is a subset of fair trade, mm -hmm. is, is, is help these, these marginalized farmers form cooperatives so that they have buying power, they have information power, they can get credit, and whole, um, whole industries of, of justice credit have, devo have evolved. So there's education has evolved, healthcare has evolved, all these benefits of cooperative operation of these small communities have come basically through the fair trade movement and, right. and the cooperative movement. And basically all you're doing is sharing a sliver of the profit that otherwise Absolutely. would yeah. go to people that already have. Right, and that's why I say it's fairer, but you know, so what we do is, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. So the fair trade minimum for organics is, is $1.91. You can buy organic coffee on the market probably for $1.40 or something. Uh, or you can get the commercial stuff, not organic, but commercial stuff for 96 cents, mm -hmm. which a lot of large companies do. Um, but if you want, if, if you want to make a di that's not going to make a difference because I've been involved in coffee now since 1988, and I haven't seen communities turn into, you know, like bedroom communities of Boston. Right. You know, nobody's getting rich growing coffee. A lot of people are getting rich selling coffee. Right but nobody's getting rich growing coffee. And the difference I've seen in the communities where there's a fair trade cooperative, you can see a difference. But it's still a marginal difference. I mean, the difference in self-esteem, mm -hmm. great, higher. The difference in kids going to school, women's empowerment, health, higher. But, you know, it, it, the problem hasn't been solved right. because we're talking about a commodity. And the poorest people in the world, whether it's in the United States or in Guatemala, are at the end of the chain. They're right. the commodity growers, right? right. The primary commodity grower, whether it's a small farm in the United States or a small farm in, in Nicaragua. Who makes the money? The processors, right? And, uh, and, and the, the retailers. The, what's most critical is who grows. Yeah, but they don't have the power to demand the price. And right? if they try to demand the price, well, they don't have the military wherewithal. Well, not only that, I mean, but, but commodities tend to be fungible, meaning they're easily replaceable, right? So what, what's happened in coffee is, you know, some swank coffee company, I could name five or six of them that people think are really cool companies, they buy from this uh, town one year, but then the town struggles the next year because of climate change or something. And rather than committed to helping them see through, they're like, eh, we'll I can go else. to some other town. Uh -huh. okay. So there's no commitment. And in fact, in uh, the original fair trade uh, licensing agreements, there used to be a requirement that you make long-term relationships with the farmers. 
that's disappeared as fair trade is also starting to become corporatized. Well, actually, that's happened with the organic movement, uh, too. Well, a little less so because organics is a legal movement, so you have some real legal things to hold on to. Right. But fair trade is an, is, is an agreement just between people. I agree that if I buy, if I'm a company and I sign a fair trade licensing agreement with Fair Trade USA or whatever, I'm only bound to pay fair trade prices for the coffee I get under that agreement. It doesn't make me buy anything. Right. So Starbucks, Green Mountain, they can sign a fair trade agreement, then they can put the logo on their website, we're a fair trade certified company. Mm, my mistake, we're a fair trade, we're a company that's authorized to buy fair trade coffee. Doesn't mean they are. It doesn't mean they are. So all these big companies like Starbucks, et cetera, are 3%, 2%, 5% fair trade, and I always say, well, what does that mean? That means 100 farmers are in a room and Starbucks goes, you, 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 and you. We're gonna treat you better. You other 96, out. That's what it is. So fair trade is not a panacea either as a commercial okay, contracting so, so, mechanism or as an ethical mechanism. So what are the solutions? I solutions. know you're always looking. Oh yeah, well, I mean, we're very small. You know, I mean, we do, about 600,000 pounds a year, which sounds like a lot, but it's not in right. the world of coffee. But every cooperative we buy, every, every place we buy from, we buy with cooperatives and help them get formed. Every cooperative we buy from, not only do we pay way in excess of fair trade pricing, our prices these days are like 250 a pound, 280, $3 a pound. And remember, the minimum for organics is 191. Right. So we're paying way more than that. But more importantly, we then have, uh, our development relationships. We haven't changed that since day one. In every village we work in, we sit with the farmers and women's groups, civics groups, and we facilitate a discussion about what are the developmental priorities in this village? What are your priorities? Then from those, we choose one or two and we design, we co-design with the farmers programs. We don't go to CARE, we don't go to Save the Children, we don't go to USAID and take your tax dollars. Mano a mano, we face to face with the farmers. We design a program that's going to meet that developmental objective. Then we fund it from our sales. So now we're putting in in in, in Ethiopia. We helped create um, we we created a um, a cervical cancer detection and treatment program, which has saved thousands of women's lives. And that's not marketing. That's real. Right. And those are the women that grow the coffee in in, in Ethiopia. Um, cervical cancer is the number one killer of women, period. Here, hardly anybody get, dies from it because it's treatable. But in a place like Ethiopia with, with poor rural medicine, women die from it left and right. Coffee women die from it. So we worked with Grounds for Health, this organization that works in coffee communities, and we introduced them to the co-ops. We ha helped the co-ops feel comfortable with the organization. We dedicated our entire profit for the year, it was three, four years ago, so over $100,000. We gave it all to this program to get this thing going because it was more important to save coffee women's lives than it was for us to have an extra $100,000 lying around. Well, and the thing is, you're a private business, yeah. and so you don't have shareholders no. that are demanding a quarterly profits. No, but my feeling about that is that, you know, um, I think it's very difficult for old businesses to change, mm -hmm. old dogs, new tricks. But startup businesses these days, it's part of the DNA. If you say, I'm going to the marketplace as a social entrepreneur, right. you know, when you raise money, the people who put the money in know that you have a social mission. So you have a different bottom line. Different bottom line and, and a good bottom line and people flock to it. There's billions available for, for social entrepreneurship out there, venture capital towards social entrepreneurship. It's not a problem raising the money. The problem's in the mindset. I lecture at business schools around the country and overseas as well. And I'll tell you, for every class on ethics or class on social entrepreneurship, there's 10 faculty saying, that's baloney, it doesn't work. But it does teach, work. I know, but teaching, the, it's, an, it's a mindset. The corporatization, the corporate culture that people learn in business school m m uh, minimizes social good. Even though a lot of schools say, oh, we've got this great program on social entrepreneurship, they don't. They, just they have a couple of classes, right. one or two professors, and the rest of the university is, telling, is saying, pay no attention to those guys. Are you getting interns from these schools, though? Oh, yeah, though? And yeah. Because so, so in a way, you're seeding other people that Trying can to. make a difference. Yeah, yeah.
Because one person or one company can yeah. only do so much. Yeah, we have a, we have a great internship program. We send uh, college and grad school students all over the world. You know, we, we pay for them. We, we embed them in a, in a cooperative and they share their skills and they obviously learn a lot. And people's lives have been significantly altered by that experience. So let me ask you this about coffee. Are, do you love drinking coffee yourself? Yeah, I like drinking coffee. I drink a cup and a half, two cups a day, but I'm not Voltaire. I don't right. do 40 cups a day, you know. Of course, back in those days, they didn't grind it. Oh, they didn't? <laughs> no, back in those days, they put the whole bean in the cup and poured hot water on it. It was more like a tea. Yeah, they didn't so, know. Yeah, so when Voltaire drank his 40 cups a day, that's what he was doing. So He'd that's be dead if he did right, I was going to say, that's probably the equivalent of a cup or two drinking mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. um, because there is, I can tell you, I, I don't always drink your coffee, mm -hmm. but I always drink organic and fair trade for what that's worth. Um, and it tastes so much better than any other coffee. There's a, there's a very specific reason for that. For years, people would say that to me. You're, why does your coffee taste so good? And I thought... Ah, karma, you know, I mean, you're, we're putting love, we're putting attention, we're putting good vibes into it. I really had no other explanation. And here in the Valley, it was a darn good explanation. Right. And I believe it on an energetic level. But finally, I found the reason why. I read this article by a Brazilian scientist, and he said that the phenols, a certain compound in the coffee, develops very slowly. And in sun coffee, which is the majority of coffee in the world, grown in large monocultural plots, mm -hmm. you know. In sun-grown coffee, the phenols develop too quickly, and so the coffee gets picked before the phenols develop that carry the flavor. And so you're gonna get, you know, uh, multinational coffee has sort of a, a bitterness right. or a sourness, and I don't even have to name the companies, you know what I'm talking about. You taste that coffee that everybody drinks every morning, and it's like, some, some underlying sourness. So I thought maybe it was pesticides or no, something. No, 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 no. Those are the phenols that haven't developed. So you go to shade-grown coffee, which takes longer to develop, so therefore you get a, 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 a slightly less yield, right. which is why a lot of people poo-poo organics. Ah, not enough yield. Yeah, but the quality of the coffee is so much better, and that's why. So that was the magic right there. I always thought it was our karma, but it's a combination of the karma and the chemicals. Okay, so but, but I'm not... So I'm not I'm not suffering from too much smug. It's actually true that mm -hmm. it tastes better. Mm -hmm. Because I was wondering, am mm -hmm. I just tricking myself by, you know, the virtue signaling or something here that they taste better? No, no, but I do believe a lot of people fool themselves by the advertising. You know, if somebody tells you this tastes like blueberry and you think they know what they're talking about, you're probably going to taste blueberry in that. Uh, we are so susceptible, aren't we? We are, and I'm afraid in the coffee industry, as much as the, the search for quality, the search for quality is a real double-edged sword. It's great because it gives us something new and interesting and gives us a way to differentiate between 20 different coffees. This one has lemony tones. This one has caramel tones. Right. This one tastes like cat poop, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. the Kopi Luwak from Indonesia, uh, which 85% of which isn't Kopi Luwak. From, from well, there's cats. only so many cats. That's exactly right. I was, I, was in, uh, I was in Indonesia once with a bunch of exporters, and they said, Mr. Dean, uh, Pamandin, they call me Uncle Dean in Indonesia. Pamandin, we have 40 containers. That's 40 times 30,000 pounds. That's a million plus pounds, a uh, million two pounds of uh, Kopi Luwak that we want to sell. Can you help us? I said, there aren't enough Luwaks in the world to make all that. What do you do, force feed the beans to your kids? Right. And they all laughed and said, no, well, well let's move on and talk about something else. So, But there's a, um, there's a, a chemist up at... Um, What's the name of that great university in uh, Canada? McGill. McGill, thank you. Yeah, chemist at McGill has tested, random tested uh, Kopi Luwak, and he says 85% of it isn't. Well, it's kind of like buying fish in a restaurant. You don't know what you're getting most Well, of the time. yeah, but you're not, you know, you're, not you're not buying it because of the certain taste. You know? right. Nobody really knows whether Chilean sea bass tastes lemony or, ta you know. Right. But with coffee, you get these expectations. Right. So when someone tells you that Kopi Luwak the, the Indonesian uh, cat poop coffee has this certain taste and aroma, you know, you kind of bring it into your head. Right. So it's, it's interesting, but, so there's a double-edged sword about the quality thing. The first is, yeah, it's great that when you have your grass-fed beef and your this and this, you get a cup of coffee that was grown on the left side of the mountain 
at a certain elevation that shaded, you know. Right. And that's why it developed the magnesium in the soil, developed this lemony taste. It's a great terroir. When the fifth exactly. Time. And that's exactly what happened. It used to be the wine thing, and now that's gone completely into coffee. That's okay, and there are very distinct differences in coffee. Not as many as are advertised, okay. but there are very distinct tastes in coffee, both a quality point of view and just the different mouthfeels. However, the, the problem for me is that the, um, the push for quality these days has been at the expense of working with the farmers on price or bringing justice in. Right. In fact, the people who started the quality movement in coffee were really a bunch of libertarians who didn't want to be told that they should pay more coffee and more money to the farmers. Really? So they sideswiped having to get like a fair trade or an organic certification and they created something called direct trade which doesn't exist there is no such thing okay. and they created a label called direct trade certified which doesn't exist who certified it they did oh my god so once again you know people get fooled by this thing and even though direct trade started with some good intentions you know from a quality point of view we're going to go directly to the farmer we're going to know who this comes from you know, stuff we've been doing for 25 years, and really plenty of people have. Ploy more it's than anything. a marketing ploy. And worse than that is that now anybody who buys coffee from a broker and asks the broker, can you tell me something about the farm? The broker says, okay, yeah, the farm is located here, and here's some pictures. Now, all of a sudden, they're direct trade. And there's a lot of coffee companies around here saying they're direct trade that have never visited a farm, maybe stay in a Holiday Inn if they do visit a farm. They're there for one day or two hours, taking pictures, picking a bean. They have no relationship whatsoever. We've been dealing with the same co-ops for over 20 years in several cases. I know the grandchildren of the farmers I've been working with. You know, this is real relationship. So in a way, marketing. you have artificially kept your business smaller. Absolutely. And is that because it's more manageable at this size? Well, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a phil philosophical reason and there's a personal reason. Okay. The philosophical reason is because, yes, Dean's Beans is an experiment. It's still an experiment. And in order to manage the experiment, we're keeping it manageable. Okay. You know, because I'm a, I'm a student of growth. I watched what happened to Ben and Jerry's. Right. You know, and I watch that and I even, I even talk to Ben about that. You know, like what happens when an organization gets a certain size? Is it eating itself up, just taking care of its own internal needs? Does it have a need to destroy competition? Right. What is it, you know? Is, in fact, I wonder, is there even a sweet spot for business size? Because people are- Mine, always, I'm happy. <laughs> well, 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 right. <laughs> But the th so the thing is, well, the thing is we've run out of time. Yeah, but let me <laughs> finish. Ahead, so now, now the personal side. Yes. The personal side is I'm not a businessman. I'm not in it to grow it and sell it. Right. I'm not even in it to make a fortune. I'm in it to prove that, that business can be a positive force for change and doesn't have to be the greedy sucker of life that it often is, especially in a global context. So you have a good quality of life. I have a great quality of life, but could I, could I have another car? Could I have another boat? You know, right. what do you need in life? When I lecture at business schools, they always ask me, what's your profit margin? And my answer is always enough. And it blows their minds, but it's enough. You know? Well, we need, uh, and we have to end the show, but we really, as a, as a people, as, as homo sapiens on this planet, we have to change the paradigm. I completely agree. That's what it's been about for 25, 26 years. Well, thank you for doing the work. And I would love to come out to your business and Please film come. you again yeah. and talk at some more in depth because I, I gained so much from you and I think our viewers do. You're an inspiration to us. Well, come talk to the, the other 13 people at Dean's Beans. Be They're very, all in it. I'll be very happy to do that. So Pleasure. thank you. And Thanks thank you for joining us. I'm Drew Hutchison. This has been Local Bias. Um, take care.